Okay, so in this video, we're going to take a look at the indirect converter. In the previous couple of videos, we've seen first the canonical switching cell on which all of these things are based. And then we've looked at the direct converter, which was one way we can orient that switching cell. And now we're looking at another way that we can orient it. So the main distinction here you'll see is that you have A, B, C, whereas in the direct converter, we had A, C, B. So we're basically just rotating the cell into different directions. And uh, this is the only other unique way to do it. Uh, you can you can have it so that A comes to the bottom and then B goes to that side or whatever, but it doesn't result in a unique connection. So there are only two unique ways that this can be connected. So that's why you have the indirect and the direct approach. Okay, and so this is the indirect converter. This is another uh, sort of class of converters. And uh, we can jump right into the analysis and we can kind of do the same thing we did in the, in the previous case. So let's imagine for a second that S, X, Y is closed for a very long time, okay? And then we can imagine when X, X, uh, X Z is closed, right? For a very long time, let's say. And so what happens in the first case? So in the first case, if this x, y is closed for a very long time, that essentially is closing this here, right? So you've done that. And now if you do that, you'll see that the voltage across the inductor is equal to V1 because you, you have a, a, a total path that just kind of goes between uh, like this. So the voltage VL becomes equal to V1. One. So this is going to be VL equals V1. And you'll notice I'm writing them as uppercase here because we're assuming that these are large enough to eliminate any ripples. So we're assuming these are purely DC voltages and currents here, at least at the terminals. I don't know, internally we'll have different things going on. Now on the other hand, we have that SXZ is closed for another duration. And if that's the case, then you'll have that this is connected here. And if XZ is connected, then VL equals V2. Now this gives rise to a sort of unique property here, uh, because if you remember that the VSB, volt second balance, implies that the average inductor voltage needs to be zero. But if in if for, let's say if this is, I don't know, I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll get into the details later, but if this is for interval one and this is for interval two, then you see that V1 plus V2, the average, if these are ever, the, if this is ever the case, they have to have opposite polarities. Otherwise, there's no way you can have VL equaling zero or the average of VL equaling zero. Because suppose if V1 is positive and this is positive, this times some duration plus this times, times some duration will give you a positive result. If they're both negative, it'll give you a negative result. If the one's positive and the other one is zero, it'll still be positive. So the only way you can ever satisfy this uh, condition, and, and you must satisfy it, is this is a property, a physical sort of law almost, uh, not almost, but basically is, um, you have to, well, you, you, it has to be such that V1 and V2 have opposite polarities, because this is true. So that means uh, it, does, it doesn't matter which way you look at it, but at the end of the day, V1 um, and V2 have opposite polarities. And they have to, right? Um, they can't have the same polarity. It's impossible. So that means one of these will have to be flipped. So you can do a similar thing when the capacitor... Um, or what by looking at the capacitors, I guess. So maybe we can just write those here, right? So we did that for the inductors, uh, but we can do the same thing for the capacitor. Uh, so you have a similar property for the capacitor as the volt second balance called the capacitor charge balance. So the capacitor charge has to be uh, zero over the entire, or the average capacitor charge has to be zero over the entire switching period. But you'll see that in one case, um, You'll see here IC is equal to minus I2, and you'll see that here IC is equal to I1. And that implies that I1 and I2 have to have the same polarity. Because if they don't, then you'll end up with 
the same issue that you had violating the vote second balance issue. So we can go back into the uh, into the the long time. Uh, SX is closed for a long time. Uh, sorry, SXY is closed for a long time. And if that's the case, so if you close SXZ for a long time, what you'll end up with is uh, V2 equals 0 and I1 equals 0. And then if you have SXY closed for a long time, you'll have that V2 over V1. Uh, well, this results in something, right? So I skipped a step here. V2 over V1 equals 0, and I1 over I2 equals 0. But in a case like this, if XY is closed, if this is closed, then you end up with V2 over V1 giving you uh, minus infinity, and then you end up with um, V, well, sorry, again, I skipped a step. So let's not get carried away here. Uh, V1 equals 0, and I2 equals 0, and that implies that V2 over V1 is minus infinity. I kind of spoiled that. And that implies that I1 over I2 is positive infinity. So, the same way we had with the direct converter, we see that the conversion ratio in this case, well, in the other case, it was between 0 and 1 somewhere, right? In this case, we see that it is between 0 and and infinity. And we'll use the volt second balance to determine what exactly it is. Okay, so we established in the analysis that we just did above that the inductor voltage should look something like this. And in this case, we're going to use the waveform approach simply because why not? Uh, so this will be here, we can call this dt, and we can call this here t, right? And we're going to say from 0 to dt, this is v1, and then after that, it becomes v2, and I want to make it so it's not symmetric, because it technically can't be, well, I guess it can, but not according to the way I've drawn it. So here we'll have, well, this whole thing is vl. Here we have v1, and here we have v2. And again, I'm not writing negative v2 or anything like that because those are, it's kind of implicit in the variable, right? I'm not going to call it negative v2. I'll just call it v2, and we know that v2 has to be negative. And so if we look at this and we apply our volt second balance, we see that v1 dt plus v2 1 minus dt must be 0. And that implies that v2 over v1 is equal to minus d over 1 minus d. And so this is a fairly interesting result, uh, and we'll discuss why in a second. But before that, we can look at the current conversion ratio, and the current conversion ratio of this is just going to be the, uh, the negative inverse, right? So I2 over I1 is 1 minus D divided by D. And again, this is from the power balance, uh, or the conservation of energy principle. Um, so, But the interesting thing about this converter is that Depending on the value of D, you may or may not have buck or boost operation. Well, you may have one or the other. I shouldn't say may or may not. You may have one or you may have the other. So this converter is usually referred to as a step up down. So they either call it up down or they call it a buck boost. Because depending on the value of D, you might have uh, something that's greater than 1 or something that's less than 1. And if it's greater than 1, obviously it's in boost mode. If it's less than 1, then it's buck mode. So the output can be higher or lower than the input depending on the value of the duty ratio. So let's look now at the sort of switch implementation of this, right? So we have this is what we're looking at. And I'm not going to go through the process of decomposing into two switches and drawing the waveforms again because we've seen that. And if you haven't seen that, I'll link the video below where we derived the uh, direct converter topology based on switches, or, or the boost, con sorry, buck converter topology based on the switches. But it's essentially what we have here is that the power, let's imagine for a second, the power is flowing from left to right. Okay, so the power is going this way. Power goes that way. And I'm going to say that V1 is greater than V2. Well, not greater than V2. V2 
is greater than zero, let's say. Okay, V1 is greater than zero. Now, that means S, Y, X, this switch here, should conduct positive current and it should block positive voltage, which means that is a transistor. Uh, V2, in this case, is we're assuming is less than zero for the conditions that we're dealing with, right? Because we said V1 is greater than zero, so that means V2 has to be less than zero. And remember, we said uh, they have to have opposite polarities. So V1 is greater than zero, V2 is less than zero for this scenario that we're imagining. It could be the opposite, it's fine. But in this case, V1 is greater than zero, power flows from left to right, and if power flows from left to right, then S, Y, X, so the switch that connects Y to X should conduct a positive current and should be able to withstand a positive voltage. So V2, uh, or sorry, that condition basically gives us the fact that the switch uh, Y, X has to be a transistor. Now, on the other hand, the switch that's connected between Z and X will have a positive current, but have to block a negative voltage. So we're gonna to have to use a diode there. So we can, based on that, based on this switching cell that we have here, that we've used for so many different things now, we can derive what is the more practical version of the um, buck boost converter. So the buck boost converter will look something like this. So remember we said we have a switch here and we have to have the inductor here connected in the middle. And you have this diode here, and the diode should go in that direction. Again, if you look at the directions that you have in the switching cell, which we will do in a second, uh, you'll notice that this has to be the direction of the diode. And here you have the, your output, okay? So you have this L, you have this C, we can call this Q. Again, I don't want to call that D because it doesn't, I mean, it might conflict with our understanding of the duty ratio. So this is V2, and then you'll have I1, and here you'll have I2. Uh, Sorry, I've drawn the capacitor in the wrong place because I've jumped ahead again. So that's not where the capacitor goes. The capacitor actually goes here. And, and I imagine people were probably screaming and wondering what's going on because the capacitor has disappeared. But no, the capacitor did not disappear. So the capacitor is there. This is Y. This is X. And this is Z. So this is what the switch implementation, the practical implementation of the uh, buck boost converter looks like. Now, if you've seen the buck boost converter, you won't recognize this uh, immediately, uh, unless you've seen variations of it, of which this is one of one such variation. But the most common variation of this converter is what I had done, what I, well, what I was doing at least when I was getting carried away, is this capacitor here is not connected there, but instead the capacitor is split between two capacitors, one here, and then, well, I've drawn that there. Uh, and the other one should go here. And so these ensure the proper filtering properties that we need, uh, and they produce a, I guess, more symmetric uh, approach, although not really, but um, I guess aesthetically maybe, in, in terms of what it looks like. Overall, the functionality is the exact same of this converter, and uh, we can call this Z. This is the more common, uh, this one here, the more common uh, topology that you'll see in practice. Uh, you can make other variations. There's no end to the number of variations that they have on these, and we'll see those in some of the later converters that we study. Um, you can add isolation, you can add multiple switches, you can add all these kind of different, I guess, bells and whistles, so to speak. But the thing that remains the same is the functionality. The conversion ratio, for instance, in this case, is the exact same. So whether I've drawn it this way or I've put the capacitor at the top or I've done it this way or I have the, the switching cell, everything remains the same. The, the physical properties remain the same. This is why 
it's so important for us to develop these converters this way as opposed to looking at them as a sort of recipe book or something where you're just going through different topologies and studying them as they are. Because fundamentally speaking, they all, for the most part, I would say, if not all of them, come back down to these basic principles of direct and indirect conversion. And then once you understand these, you can start to look at those topologies, more complicated topologies. You can start to develop your own topologies so long as you don't violate any of these principles. So it's a very useful and, uh, and and fundamental approach to understanding things. Uh, it's always better to understand the, the basic underlying f- principles uh, for a concept than to look at some recipes. I mean, recipes are good, but at the end of the day, if you really want to understand stuff, you should be looking and you should be approaching your problems in a way like this. So I hope this was helpful. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments below. Like and subscribe to support the channel, and we'll see you in the next one.